My name is Fernando Figueira. I am a sociologist. Uh, I come from Uruguay. Uh, and uh, my research has mainly focused on issues of inequality and welfare state policies. Uh, my work has centered mostly on Latin America, but I have some work regarding the Global South, uh, trying to look at patterns and evolution of welfare policies and how they have been successful or not uh, in terms of increasing social protection and equality. Uh, the chapter I mean actually working in the social panel, it's uh, social justice and well-being. So most definitely my work fits into that and part of uh, what we have been discussing uh, in the International Social Panel. Uh, in International Panel of Social Progress, it's uh, about the different uh, devices uh, and instruments that societies have given themselves regarding the promotion of equality, of opportunity, equality of outcome, uh, social progress and social justice. It's a wonderful opportunity uh, to meet with colleagues and uh, learn from different perspectives, interdisciplinary perspectives. Uh, as a sociologist, I actually have integrated in my work a lot of demographics, political science and economy. But uh, there are also uh, colleagues here from uh, political philosophy, political economy that are, uh, bring to the table things that are interesting to me. Uh, now, in terms of uh, achievement, I hope that the work we do here is able to at least uh, help decision makers and scholars to think about alternative ways to unregulated capitalism, to produce and promote both efficiency and quality. Uh, I think that's a challenge. There is a paradigm that somewhat became obsolete, which is that of the uh, post-war welfare state and recognition policies. Uh, but there is another paradigm that I believe is uh, increasingly uh, demonstrating its incapacity to provide what we want, which is uh, what has prompted the neoliberal revolution based on neoclassic economics understood in a very limited way and that we need to reframe, reshape that and that's both an analytical challenge, an empirical research challenge and a normative uh, challenge. So I hope that our chapter and the debate that this chapter can contribute to uh, will help uh, move things along that way and suggest through some strong messages that this is uh, a technical and a political possibility and that we should strive to go in different ways. This work that was done, uh, research that was done on the social structure and social inequalities in Latin America, looking at the changing patterns of labor and family. Uh, there has being major transformations, both in the realm of uh, family arrangements and how families work, and in the area of labor markets. When you think about how people secure uh, welfare for themselves, they do it through basically three institutional arrangements. Those regarding the market, those regarding families, and those regarding the state. My work on Latin America tries to look at the changing patterns of labor and family and how the welfare state has responded to those transformations and, it, and if those responses have been adequate or inadequate uh, to create an adequate safety net and adequate promotion of capabilities and equalization. And I come to the conclusion that basically it has not. Uh, that uh, when you look at the changes that families have undergone and labor migrants have undergone, uh, and you look then at what has happened with the welfare state, the two major responses that you get are wrong ones. Uh, one is the traditionally, uh, the, the model that we traditionally would call the contributory 
Bismarckian model uh, that is based on formal labor, which has never been a reality in Latin America and is less so in many ways, uh, and on the single breadwinner model of the family, where the main is the main, the main breadwinner, which is also not true now, and in the assumption of a stable, long-life family arrangements, which is also not true now. So basically, the transformation of family and labor should have been accompanied by a different response. That response was wrong, and the neoliberal response of just targeting social policies to the poor in countries in which between 20 and 40 percent of the population are poor is also the wrong response. So how do you move towards more universal social policies that actually address the new risks and inequalities that come from a transformed landscape of labor markets and family is one of my works. There are a couple of uh, a book and a couple of papers there uh, that I've tried to uh, develop this idea. The other work is strongly related to this one, but it's more a proposal of an alternative way of looking at how to construct both efficient efficient and inclusionary welfare regimes. And it's called uh, Basic Universalism. It's a proposal that uh, I wrote with some colleagues and that has uh, been considered both in the Latin American debates as one of the proposals towards universalism, but also in, in countries in Africa and in Asia, in which this idea of basic universalism, which implies that you should provide non-targeted limited but quality services and insurances to the population not based on their labor adscription or on their family status uh, constitutes, I think, uh, an interesting proposal that has a lot of things to rethink and reshape, but that has, I believe, uh, provided an interesting source of debate and change in social policy in Latin America and in the South. One important issue that is understated in my work, but I think part of my work bring, brings it forth, and I've seen in the discussion of, uh, of the panel that it's actually very present for many of our colleagues, is the issue of what are the possibilities of shaping these new arrangements under present-day conditions of capitalism and globalization. I think that that is a critical issue, and when you look at the reality of Europe, and the attack on the welfare state and the both fiscal and political limits that it's finding. Uh, it, it makes me rethink some of the things I've been uh, researching and debating, but it also, I think, what I'm bringing to the panel uh, provides a theoretical rationale for defending and transforming the present patterns of welfare provision that we have in both developed and developing countries. That's one of the things that I think is an issue that comes to mind. The second one, which I think is relatively novel to the debate that we are having here, is that you can always rank uh, your social policy systems or your welfare states given on how much they spend, on how much they redistribute, and that's done a lot. But it's not done so much is how do they adequately, how do they, how are they able to change, to respond to the changing patterns of risks and the distribution of risks that changes in other realms of society bring about, to put a simple example. The fact that we had uh, uh, social security systems with pensions uh, at the age of 55 in the 1960s, reflected a concrete risk regarding both labor market participation and old age for a certain period of time. Probably today, uh, we don't need to have uh, a retirement age of 55 or 58. We can move to 65 or even more, right? But at the same time, children between the ages 0 and 4 were supposed to be protected mostly by stable families that earn through the male breadwinner a living wage. That's no longer true. 
you need two wages at least, and you don't have stable families. So both and women have become incorporated into the labor market to an extent that they were not, and they have to shoulder usually double responsibilities of reproduction and of production with wages. Now, how do you create a social policy system that understands that there are new vulnerabilities that become concentrated in women and children, and especially very young children? It's a critical issue. So it's not just how much money you spend, it's not how much you redistribute, but it's also that you get the puzzle correct. If what makes a person uh, live in relative tranquility and security comes from at least three spheres, families, markets and state, and families and markets change, then the state should also change in accordance to those changes and the new patterns of risks and distribution and intensity of risks that that creates among the population. Borrowing from, from Peter Hall, you can talk about three levels of change. There's one level of change that implies minor modifications in the dominant tools that you have to deal with these situations. There are other changes, second level changes, that actually modify big tools of the system. And then there are paradigmatic changes, in which you are not simply changing the means, but the end of the instrument, what the instrument protects. I hope in my life to see first and second level changes. That is, the capacity of our tools to understand a change in reality and to adapt our metrics and our minor instruments there. Uh, for example, I want to see an expansion of uh, welfare benefits towards children. Uh, I want to see, let's say, a very minor change that indexation according to cost of life, which always happens in pensions, will also happen uh, in child benefits. I want to see some new tools, second level changes. I want to see a transformation in the notion of uh, salary and non-salary work, uh, wage work and non-wage work. I want to see the economies of care emerge. I want to see a state that develops a system of care, both for the elderly and for uh, small children. I want to see that system as a new component of welfare states that is geared not simply towards the redistribution of income and possibilities and opportunities and of security, but also a redefinition of the social and sexual division of labor. Right? Okay, and I don't think I'll see it in my lifetime, but I want to see third level changes, paradigmatic changes. I want to see a transition from what we today assume as given, which is capitalism, uh, not just unregulated capitalism, but capitalism in general, to some form of social cooperation and uh, command over capital. That doesn't mean socialism in its traditional forms, but it does mean that a number of things that today work not just within markets, which I expect it will continue to work in many cases within markets, but the appropriation, the appropriation of productivity and rent that comes from those operational markets, right, uh, is based on a completely, in many cases, private command over those capitals. I want to see more extended forms of uh, property which are not necessarily only state, they can be also employee, cooperatives, etc. Now, that's third level change, and that's something that doesn't come just out of our chapter, I hope it comes from the whole International Social Bank. Now, for that to happen, we need a second type of uh, third level change or paradigmatic change, which is some form of global governance. Today we have clearly uh, global capitalism, but we don't have effective forms of global governance. We have the United Nations, we have some regional uh, blocks, we have some additional global multilateral institutions like the IMF, etc. 
but don't, we don't have a system of global taxation. We don't have a governance that can actually uh, legislate and enforce rules of trade, rules of capital mobility, etc. Those things are needed as the nation state was needed. I mean, at, at, at the territorial level, what markets did was destroy basic forms of solidarity and cooperation within small communities and the nation state was somewhat a response to that, a creation of an upper level uh, form of uh, politics controlling uh, markets and capital. Well, we now have a global uh, dimension of that, so we need some form of global governance that I, I don't think it will materialize in my time, but it will evolve.